What's good? My name is Jamani. And I'm John. And this is Soul Sit Down. So how are you feeling today? Feeling good, man. Feeling like a champ, baby. How That's, you doing? I'm doing pretty good. Good. So the first question that I have for you is, what what did you what do you do for a living? Well, right now I just retired. Uh, I retired from the Tennessee Department of Corrections. Yes, sir. With uh, thirty years and nine months, and so uh, right now uh, I'm retired and uh, I started a, a, a food truck. A barbecue food truck, so that's what I'm doing now. Yes, sir. So, how is the food truck going, and how was it working in the um the correctional officer? How is that? So, I guess I'll start with the with my career. Yeah, you know, when I just retired, at um, I started out as a correctional officer with Tennessee Department of Corrections. I just got out of the military, and. Uh, I actually took a friend of mine to Nashville to take the test for a correction officer. Yeah, the rest of the state, and uh, you know it's about a forty-five minute drive from Clarksville to Nashville. And then when I got there, it was like, man, it's gonna take me about two hours to take this test. And so I'm like, what am I supposed to do for two hours? He's like, well, come on, take the test. <laughs> yeah, sir. So uh, I went in and took the test, and that was on like a Tuesday. And Friday, I had two letters in the mail that said I had qualify for positions in, uh, as a correction officer. Yes, yeah, sir. And so uh, that's how I actually started. Uh, started out as a correction officer. Um, I worked my way up through the ranks. Uh, There's nothing in the, in the correctional field I hadn't done. I didn't want to really be a correction officer because I had so many family that was locked up back in Texas. Yes, yeah, sir. And that was kind of like taboo for you to be the police yeah, sir. Uh, <laughs> or for you, you know, work for the correction because I had a lot of people that was in prison. Yes, yeah, sir. A lot of family members. So uh, I really didn't want to, but I got it. And I thought, man, we're going to just come check it out and see what it do. Uh, ended up working for a little while, a uh, couple of months, turned into a year or two. Then I found out that they was going to give us uh, what they call longevity. Yes. Yeah, so after three years, you get a check. A little bonus check. Yes, yeah, sir. So I'm like, well, I'm just going to stay long enough to get the bonus check. Then yeah, I'm going to slide on out of there. <laughs> Got that bonus check. And I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> I, didn't tell, I didn't tell my ex-wife about it then either. Yes, yeah, sir. So uh, I just told her some extra cash. So we was doing good and kept that little money in my pocket. Yes, yeah, sir. And uh, the next year, that longevity came again. I just kept on going. So I'm going <laughs> to stay to my next longevity. I'm going to get on out of there. Yes, yeah, sir. And I just kept on doing it, man. And then before you knew it, um, I was security threat group coordinator dealing with gang members, uh, doing drug testing. Uh, I was supervisor in the, uh, the max mental health units. Yeah, sir. Uh, it just, I'm just moving around, man. Just making my way up. Grievance and D-board and, and just anything dealing with corrections. I was just, I was mastering. I was running circles around folks. Yeah, sir. So after a little while, um, my, my interest kind of peaked at, uh, we had a, a person that I, uh, uh, some inmates told me that they was bringing in drugs. And so I was trying my best to set them up and couldn't do it. <laughs> and uh, finally, uh, I got them enough on them on yeah, my recorder. I, I snuck a recorder in with me. And we weren't supposed to. Yeah, we weren't sir. supposed to have a recorder. But <laughs> I snuck the recorder in. And um, I recorded them. Uh, and then they got him in trouble. And then I started, I was like, well, man, you're doing pretty good. Won't you go and be internal affairs? Yeah, sir. So I started doing some internal affairs work, you know, for the in-house, what we call in-house. Uh, that went well. And then an uh, old guy by the name of Jason Woodall, uh, he was what we call big internal affairs for the state. Yeah, sir. Uh, they investigate criminal and administrative matters for the department. They had full police powers and all that good stuff. So he came to me, he was like, man, how much, what you like coming to internal affairs? I was like, yeah, 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 that's cool, I, I do that. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and like, well, you got to go to police academy. I was like, yeah, okay, no problem. Then you got to go to TBI academy, Tennessee Bureau of Investigations. I was like, yeah, that's cool. I was like, well, what about that police academy? What's going on with that? <laughs> He's like, yeah, you got to go to the academy. I was like, like the real police academy? He was like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, you might got to run and do push-ups and all that. Like, yeah, yeah, you got to do all that. Was it something that you was like hesitant about doing it? Yeah, like that? man. Because you know, I've been, I've always been kind of big. Yeah, sir. You know, now when I say big, 
uh, when I got out of the military, I was weighing about 220. Yes, sir. Um, and But I was solid, you know. And even while I was in the military, I used to lift weights and stuff. Yes, sir. You know, my, my pecs and my arms and everything was really, really big. And, yes, sir. And uh, even in the military, I was overweight because I lifted weights so much. So they had, I had to do what they call a tape test. So I had... When I got out of the military and started working in prison system, I gained I gained all that muscles just turned to, to big bigness. Yeah, sir. You know, so I was hesitant to go to the police academy because I didn't know if I can pass the, the physical fitness training. Yes, yeah, sir. But what I did is uh I went on a little diet, I lost a little weight, ended up going to the police academy and went through with flying colors. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, never fell out of a run. In fact, they named the run after me. They called the the John Fisher Shuffle. And people today still, it was probably about six, seven months ago, I was talking to a guy, and I knew they, they had just him. graduated. Yeah, sir. And I was like, man, I went to the, I was in class 12, 25. He was like, oh, really? He said, yeah. I said, man, you know, we used to run and, and do stuff. And I said, they named the run after me. He said, run? He said, uh, the John Fisher Shuffle? <laughs> I said, yeah, that's me. Yeah, sir. He said, what? He said, man, we still talk about that. How did it make you feel, like, them naming the run after you? Man, it was a trip. Uh, You know, it was, I was proud, but uh, at the time, it was just trying to get through the academy, dude. Yeah, sir. You know, we was doing exercises and push-ups, and and I did PT twice a day. Yeah, sir. You know, I lost uh, seven, eight pounds in the police academy. Uh, that's just straight from eating good, working out, you know, doing PT twice a day. Yeah, sir. And uh, that they named that run out to me, man, because I never fell out of a run. I was the biggest person, obviously, in the class. Yeah, And sir. I probably, today, probably was the biggest person that ever came through the, the uh, police academy. Yeah, sir. Uh, down in Donaldson. And so, yeah, it was good, man. But anyway, grad, went through the police academy, uh, went through the Tennessee Bureau of Investigations, and that kind of gave us the best of both worlds. You know, I can investigate criminal matters. Um, but the TBI, I mean, police academy taught you how to be police, yeah, but sir. TBI academy taught you how to investigate. Yes, yeah, sir. So we was able to investigate our own homicides and uh, all that good stuff. So uh, I became a special agent uh, in the Tennessee Department of Corrections, uh, Internal Affairs Division, um, where we investigated both criminal and administrative actions. Uh, when I got there, we was only doing about you know, 10% was criminal and we was investigating probably 90% of administrative actions, you know, yeah, sexual sir. harassment cases and stuff like that. And when I got outside the police academy, I was like, man, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sell some dope. I'm going to catch the officers. You know, we're going to take it to another level. Yes, yeah, sir. And needless to say, I mean, I'm proud of it. But after a couple of years, you know, our focus changed from administrative to we were then doing about 85% criminal investigations. Uh, I did the first drug reverse uh, on a correction officer, and I, I did the undercover role myself. Yeah, arrested sir. the staff person, and uh, it went good. Uh, I later became the special agent in charge, uh, what they call the SAC for internal affairs for, uh, for the Middle Tennessee region. Uh, I went on to become the um, the interim director of the state. What's that? Uh, so the director of the state of Tennessee for back then, uh, we had changed the name from Internal Affairs to uh, Investigation and Compliance. Yes, yeah, sir. And that uh, put everything under one umbrella. Oh. Uh, it was the our special ops, uh, special operations unit, which is what we call Strike Force. And that was a, a specialized unit that could mobilize and go anywhere in the state. Uh, for you know, uh, crisis situations, yes, yeah, riots and, and serious situations. Uh, our canine unit that we had drug and tracking canines. Uh, I also created or helped create the apprehension enforcement unit, yes, yeah, which was a, a group of specialized agents. And all they did was go kick in doors and look for absconders and escapees and stuff like that. Yes, yeah, sir. So the director kind of took over all that. And also for the compliance area, yeah, they sir. go out and um, um, to the different prison facilities and other places to make sure they was in compliance. Yeah, uh, you know, through the annual inspections and stuff like that. So the director overseeing all of that for the entire state, 
and I was the interim director. And interim just mean um, I was the named director while they was looking for somebody to take over. Um, and I did that for about two and a half years. So what started out is just come on and hold a seat for a minute. Yes, yeah, Ended up being almost two and a half years. Yes, yeah, sir. So we accomplished a lot during that time period. Uh, after that, they did eventually hire somebody, and then I became the director of investigations. So uh, then I just went back to uh, directing all the investigations for the state. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, I was in charge of, of investigations. Um, back then, it was four agents in each region, uh, in the Middle East and West. Yes, yeah, sir. And so uh, I supervised them, and again, they investigated uh, everything criminal and administrative. Uh, after that, Jamani, uh, my commissioner, my then commissioner, wanted me to come out of internal affairs and wanted me to come downtown and work for, uh, uh, then was our, our deputy commissioner or assistant commissioner. Yes, sir. And didn't really want to do that because I felt like I had the best job in the state. Yes, sir. I mean, <laughs> in state government, first of all, Department of Corrections was the largest or still is the largest entity in state government. So for me to say I had the best job in the entire state, man, you couldn't ask for nothing better. Yes, yeah, sir. And I loved it. And I didn't want to leave. My commission was like, nah, we need you to do something different. Yeah. <laughs> so I came out and uh, I was uh, our former commissioner, Tony Parker. I was his, his first ever special assistant. And all the only thing I did basically was just run the prisons for him, you know. Uh, I wasn't a warden. Uh, in fact, a lot of wardens, and I'll tell you that story here in a second. Okay. But a lot of wardens was was kind of upset that I was running it. Yes. Yeah, because I'd never been a warden. And so, you know, it's kind of like, how can you be telling me what to do if you ain't never did what I do? Yes, yeah, sir. But yeah. I ain't trying to my own horn, but, man, I was always above average. And I, I was, you know, my goal was just to be the best at everything I do. Yeah, you know? sir. And so uh, I did that for a year, and then uh, he put me out in West Tennessee as what they call a correctional administrator. Uh, and basically that means uh, I took a region of the state, and I was in charge of all the prisons in that, in that region for the yeah, state. Yeah, sir. And so I was the uh, correctional administrator for the West Tennessee region. Um, I had four prisons, yeah, four prisons that I supervised and managed. And... Um, Basically, the West Tennessee prisons was the worst at the time, and my job was to get them back on track. Yes, yeah, sir. So I did that. Um, I was there for about a year, a little bit over a year, and then uh, we was having problems in Middle Tennessee, so he brought me to the Middle Tennessee, and I was correctional administrator in Middle Tennessee for a while, and then I went to the Core Civics. Uh, that's a private prison that manages our Tennessee inmates. Yes, yeah, sir. And I supervised the core civic facilities until I retired. And so uh, I retired as a correction administrator supervising core civic facilities. Um, and again, you know, the wardens, uh, not, not everybody, but, and some of them were just, you know, it's kind of, how do you supervise me and you ain't never been a warden? Because I skipped the warden level. Yes, yeah, sir. And to, 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 to move up. Yes, yeah, sir. And so it wasn't the fact that I wasn't a warden, but I got I got the I got everything, the skills and everything I needed because I was executives in other areas. Yes, yeah, sir. And you know, it just made me, you know, eligible to be it. Yes, yeah, sir. And uh I think I did a pretty good job, man. When I retired, you know, one of the questions that I was asked, you know, what what was what was my ultimate goal? Like what 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 drove me, and it was simple, man. I just wanted everything I touched to be better than it was when I when I had it. Yes, yeah, uh, when I found it, and I think I did that. Um, and so that's kind of the the history of the Department of Correction in that that you know thirty plus years. Yes, yeah, sir. And um and I retired early too, man. You know you can retire with thirty years. Actually, you can retire at twenty years, and thirty years you get full retirement. But um. I had enough time on the books that I could retire early because I can use that time to translate into to work time. Yes, yeah, sir. And so I, I did what they call early retirement, and I was able to retire, uh, full retirement with 30 years. 30 years and nine months. Uh, <laughs> and nine months is important, man. <laughs> I don't want them to cheat me. <laughs> and so, uh, and then that's how I transitioned to, 
you know, wants their barbecue, man. Yeah, sir. Yeah. So, before I dive deep into the barbecue, what was, like, the best experience, at, like, for your career? And then what was the worst experience in your career field? Wow. Man, you know, I think all of them, to me, was was best experience. Yeah, sir. Because um, it was just... Just something that that I love doing, man. That's that's all I know for for the last thirty years. Yes, uh, sir. You know, my military. I started out in the military, and that career was good. Um, and again, man, I don't. I'm not trying to sound arrogant or or nothing like that, man. But you know, I tell folks I've been a leader all my life. Yes, sir. You know, and the military kind of kind of toned that up a little bit. Yes, sir. But, you know, when I was in Pee Wee football, I was a captain of the team. Uh, when I was in middle school, I was captain of the football team. Uh, I was in junior, RO2, junior ROTC, uh, and I was a leader in that. You know, yeah, I was right. the, the command sergeant major, uh, even while I played football. And believe it or not, I was in JROTC, and my, my teammates didn't even know it because ROTC was – the sixth period, our last class, yes, and I didn't like wearing the uniform. <laughs> so I, I always thought, man, I don't want to wear that old green uniform. Yes, yeah, sir. So it's like, uh, I wouldn't wear my uniform until the time I go to the bathroom, change clothes <laughs> at between fifth and sixth period. Yes, yeah, sir. And when I got out of ROTC, it was time to go to football practice. So I changed clothes in the armory, and they didn't even know it, man. Yes, yeah, we, we was going to parades and everything. <laughs> and somebody saw me in a parade, and it was like, Big finish. Man, you in ROTC. <laughs> like, what are you doing? Yeah, sir. But uh, it was cool. But I was a, I, I've was been a leader my whole life, man. Everything got touched. When I went in the military, I was a leader. We had what they call Action Jack. You know, I wasn't a sergeant, but I acted like the sergeant. Yeah, sir. You know, uh, just everything we did, man. And when I got into corrections, man, I ran circles around folks. Uh and it didn't stop when I got as I got promoted and everything I did. You know, when I was uh an agent in internal affairs, man, the director of internal affairs, him and his buddy, Jason Woodall, they would go on these fishing trips for a week at a time. Yeah, sir. And you had an agent in charge in each region, and they would leave me in charge. And wouldn't even leave the, the special agent charge in charge. And so it was just like, man, I just, I've been doing all my life. Yeah, sir. You know, when I was a correction administrator, I did stuff that the correction administrator just didn't do, you know. And in my own way, I used to say, man, uh, I'm pretty good at what I do. But, and and all our correction administrators are great. They they supervise these regions. They deal with some of the worst of the worst. Yeah, that sir. Don't nobody want to deal with, you know, people that, regular people, uh, in the free world, wouldn't know how to handle, you know, murderers and rapists and, and drug sellers and all this stuff that they deal with on a daily basis. And then they take the worst of those, and those are the people that they manage yeah, and deal with. But, uh, man, I always pride myself in, in doing what the other folks didn't do. You know, uh, I'd be up in the middle of the night at the prisons. I'd wake up uh, 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning, go to the bathroom when I was in West Tennessee, and couldn't go back to sleep. I get him a golf cart and ride him to the compound. Yes, yeah, sir. He was like, man, what is this dude doing? He don't never <laughs> sleep. You know, I go to the annex in the middle on a Saturday in the middle of the day, and I sit down and play dominoes with the inmates. And, and, and nobody ever did that, you know. Now, was it right or wrong? Who's to say? Yes, yeah, sir. But me sitting down, interacting with the inmates, you know, you can't go nowhere in the state, east, middle, west, private prisons. Everybody knew John Fisher. Yeah, sir. Everybody knew Big Fish. And they knew I was about the business. And that's where it's always been, man. I pride myself in that. Yeah, sir. When you say the worst ever, uh, probably is a good friend of mine. I got a phone call one morning that she had died. Yeah, sir. And that shook me up. And then we later found out that uh, she was murdered. Uh, she was a correction administrator. Uh, her name is Deborah K. Johnson. And that probably was the worst. Yeah, sir. That was pretty hard. 
But uh, we tracked him down. He tried to run. We tracked him down. We hunted him. And we brought him to justice. Yeah, that probably was the worst. Yeah. I appreciate you for sharing that with me. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that one. <laughs> I appreciate you. you yeah. Doing all right? Yeah, we straight. Um. So, what's the craziest experience that like you experienced just being in the facilities, like working with the inmates? Man, you know, um, uh, I've been stabbed with a pencil. Yes, yeah, sir. Um. I've witnessed homicides. I mean, right as an officer, uh, as a supervisor, uh, I was there for uh, a hostage situation, two hostage situations, one at River Bend, uh, and I was actually the hostage negotiator, uh, helping out on that. And then we had another hostage situation where officers were seriously hurt at Turner Center. Yes, I know. I just made crush administrator. Uh, well, it'd been about a year, and it was time for me to come to, to Middle Tennessee. But uh, I went down to help defuse that situation, and that's probably the craziest man is uh, them guys took staff hostage. Yeah, so we have to deal with that. Yeah. So, been given that like you've always been in a leadership position, what do you feel like it takes for a person to be a good leader or to become a great leader? That's a good question, man. You know, I think uh, first, and it's kind of cliche that, you know, you lead, follow, or get out of the way. Yes, yeah, sir. But I think that first, you have to be able to follow. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, because uh, ain't nobody just wake up and you're just a leader. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, not in today's society. So you have to follow, and you follow to the best of your ability. And once you become a good follower, then you take all the traits of all the other leaders that you see. It's not just, you know, I want to be like John Fisher. I want to be like Jason Woodall. I want to be like Gloria Fisher or whoever it is, whatever leader you decide to be. Yeah, sir. What you do is you take their best traits from all of them, and then you combine them and then you make it work for yourself. Yeah, sir. You know what I'm saying? You put your own fingerprint on it. And that's what makes you a good leader, you know. And 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 being able to know the difference that people don't follow you uh, because they have to. Some do. Yeah, don't sir. get me wrong. Some people follow you just because they have to. You know, I got wardens who they did what I said just because I was a correction administrator. Yeah, sir. Uh, but there was some that wanted to follow me because I was a good leader. Yeah, sir. You know what I'm saying? And I just didn't have enough on that. And I wasn't always the best leader. Yeah, sir. You know what I'm saying? I had to learn a lot along the way. When I first uh, moved up into the world of executive service, uh, I probably wasn't a real good leader. I mean, I, don't get me wrong, I had great leadership skills. Yes, sir. But, it was but just, I had some skills that wasn't as great, too. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, and probably my biggest my biggest downfall early on as a as an executive was my communication skills. Because I had a bad mouth. Yeah, I talk sir. loud. People think because I'm big, you know, I'm boisterous. And well, I can tell somebody the sun shine outside. They take it the wrong way. Yes, yeah, sir. Oh, Lord, if it's a, he done got on me, told me the sun <laughs> shining outside. I mean, but, you know. Yes, yeah, sir. I had to learn my communication skills because I'm old military. And, you know, it was better for us to cut somebody out. Yes, yeah, sir. And, and, get, and get them right than to write them up. Yes, yeah, sir. And then you hurt their they career. You know what I'm saying? So... As an executive, my early on, and I don't mind telling you this because I used to tell this story, and this guy knew, I mean, he just knew I was going to tell the story when people asked about it. Yes, yeah, sir. So I, I, I told a guy one time, I said, listen, I need you to change the codes on our door because we had just terminated somebody, and we had to, you had to punch a key code to get in, and everybody knew the key, the key code. So yeah, I said, man, I need you to change the key code. He said, no problem, boss. I got it. I was on a Monday. So about Wednesday, Thursday, uh, 
key code still the same. You hadn't changed it. I said, hey, man, I need you to change that key code. Said, yes, sir, I got it. Got busy. So went to the weekend, came back Monday. Uh, key code still the same. I said, man, look, I need you to change the key code, man. I mean, you know how important it is. He's like, boss, I'm, I just got tied up. I said, I'm going to take care of it. Well, we had an inmate that escaped in East Tennessee, so I had to go to East Tennessee to help supervise that. Yes, sir. Went to East Tennessee, came back Friday. The code still hadn't been changed. So he came to the office. He was asking about the escape, and I was just talking all night to so come. And I said, let me ask you a question. What the fuck does it take for you to change the fucking key code? Now, I'll ask you and ask you, your ass still ain't changed this goddamn code. Here it is. Two weeks later, yeah, and you right. still ain't changed the fucking code. What does it take? Just tell me. And he kind of looked at me, and tears started coming out of his eyes. He said, I'm going to change it right now. He got up and walked out, and he changed it. But I knew then that I had went too far. Yes, yeah, sir. Even though it was so important. This, to me, this was, this was crucial. Because, we, you know, in the world that we live in, you know, in internal affairs, people come see us and they know it's not good. You know, we're talking about people who staff, who been with the department 20 years, who got families, who got families that's sick and 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 kids that's this on disabilities and and they come to us and we finna farm and take all their benefits and you know those type of people, you know, they can easily turn sideways on you. Yes, yeah, sir. So it's like important that we change this. And now he's changing it, but at the length that I went to to get him to change it, yes, it was, man, I knew then I had messed up. He changed it. Yeah, he sir. wouldn't change it right then. But I knew that I had, man, I had hurt him to the core. This guy was, was quiet, cool, calm, collective. He never cursed. You know, he go to church faithfully. You know, he's just a good person. Yes, yeah, sir. And I snapped on him. Cause so in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, maybe if I talk to you like this, maybe you'll get it. Yes, yeah, sir. But it was the wrong thing. See, I had to tighten up my communication skills. I had to hone in my communication skills. Yes, yeah, sir. And there was another situation. We had I had a female agent that worked for me. She was smart as a whip. Man, I'm talking about her IQ level was so high. Yes, yeah, sir. But she was real simple. Like, when I say... Like, she couldn't even back a car up out the driveway. Yeah, sir. Like, she drove a Porsche 911. You know, she come from money. Her family had money. Yes, yeah, sir. But she couldn't even back a car out the driveway and was going to go to the police academy. So I took her to the fire range because she had never fired a gun before. Yes, yeah, sir. And she was terrified of guns. And every time she got ready to bring her, her weapon out of a holster, she would put her hand in front of the barrel and come down to the grill. And I would say, hey, Ro, you can't do that because you're going to shoot your hand off. Yeah, sir. And she's like, oh, yeah, that, that makes sense. That makes sense. And she'd do it again. And she'd put it, bring the hand down the barrel. She's like, oh, I did it again. Then I said, yep, you did it again. Man, she did that about seven, eight times. And finally, I just had enough. I took her, told her take her headphones off so she could hear me. I said, if you put your hand in front of that pistol one more time, I said, I'm going to smack the shit out of you. You understand what I'm telling you? She said, yes, sir. She shed a tear. She put her headgear back on. And she never ever put her hand in front of that pistol again. Yeah, sir. I accomplished what I needed to accomplish. But it wasn't necessarily the best way. But it wasn't necessarily the best way. Yeah, sir. So, you know, those are situations where I realized that you got to fix your communication skills. Yeah, sir. Because you can't continue to be an executive in today's society and talk to people like like they ain't got good sense. Yes, yeah, sir. Even though, I mean, I say they ain't got good sense. You know, uh, I know they got good sense, but you just can't continue to cuss. And and, and some people will say belittle them. Yes, yeah, sir. But in my mind, it's like sometimes that tough love is the best love. Yes, yeah, sir. You know what I'm saying? But it, it, it got the job done. But those were situations that taught me that, there's another, there's always a better way. You know what I'm saying? And and now I pride myself on that because um, I had an old sergeant used to tell me all the time, you know, fish, you let your emotions override your intellect. 
And for a long time, I didn't even understand what he was mean. I was, I'd be like, okay, whatever. Yeah, sorry. And but he would always tell me that. And it wasn't until I picked up the dictionary and looked at it, I was like, damn, he might be right. Yeah, sorry. And so then I started practicing what they call non non uh, verbal techniques. Um, um, that's not the right word. Non crisis violent intervention. And basically, being able to talk your way out of stuff, being able to talk it down instead of using profanity and being able to be calm and cool and collected. Yes, yeah, sir. I've always been calm, cool, and collected, but I just had a bad mouth about me. Yes, yeah, sir. And so when I started practicing those skills, then it made things better. And now people will say, you know, that John Fisher, he can talk a, a coon out of a tree with six hound dogs on the ground. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, I just had to get for gab, man. I just, I, just, I honed in on it. And, and just made it the best I can be, man. Yes, yeah, sir. And now I see things from a different standpoint. Now I can have a conversation with a person and just rip them apart. And I ain't got to use them for fans. I ain't got to raise my voice. All it is is just me getting in that mind of theirs. Yes, yeah, sir. And I can do it, man. I'm, I'm one of the best at it. Yes, yeah, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so a question that I have now before transitioning into the um, barbecue what is like the top two or three things that like the military being an officer, like what is the top two or three things that that taught you that you apply to your life like now? Well, probably, let me see. That's another good question. Ah, the top two or three things that I can apply now. Um, man, some kind of way we got to work in respect off in there. Yeah, sir. Because in the correctional field, you have to be respectful. Because if you don't, man, it can it can go south so many different ways. We talk about inmates and, you know, people who have bad days all the time. You know, you learn to treat them with respect. And then in turn, you earn respect. Yeah, sir. And so... Uh, even in today's world, man, I try to be respectful to everybody I see, everybody I come across. Uh, you don't never know when somebody's having a bad day, uh, you know, what type of, of night they've had. Yeah, sir. And just that respect thing. The other thing is probably commitment. I learned about commitment uh, in the military and in corrections and even in to my livelihood today. Yeah, sir. Uh, as a father, uh, as a as a brother, uh, you know I'm a part of the, the Nashville Masonic Prince Hall affiliated lodge. Uh, we have to have commitment, and that goes a long way with being a father because you got responsibilities. Yes, yeah, and you have to have some commitment. Uh, I was committed to the military. I was committed as a as a state employee, and I'm also committed as a family member. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, you know, my commitment is, you know, make sure I honor God first uh, and my wife and family second. And then everything else is after that. Yes, sir. And so that commitment goes a long way. Um, after that, man, it's just, you know, just giving God all the glory, man, and, and just trying to be the best you can be at whatever it is you do. Yes, sir. You know, when I, when I pray, man, because uh, I, I love prayer. You know, I'm God-fearing. Uh, I try to go to church. I don't, I ain't the very best Christian. I still got vices and stuff that I deal with that the Lord and I, he knows I'm working on. Yeah, sir. But I always pray that God makes me uh, a better man. Yeah, sir. Uh, a better husband to my wife, a better father to my children, a better friend to all of my friends. I got a lot of friends. Yeah, sir. Uh, friends that's, that's closer than friends, friends that's, that's like brothers, like, like we was born from the same mom, but different mamas. Yes, yeah, sir. And then just a better person in general. And I think if, if you, if you pray for those five things and you believe them, then that just makes you a good person. Yes, yeah, sir. And I like to think that I'm a good person because I work on those five things. Um, and those are things that, that I think uh, that I've learned from, you know, my life growing up as a child, from the military transition 
to the state, um, and, and where we are today. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, I definitely like to agree with you that you are a great person. Man, I appreciate that. No problem. That means a lot coming from you. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Um, now transitioning into the um, barbecue and like, what made you want to start doing that? Man, well, you know, I just live in Tennessee. I'm from Texas. Yes, sir. And people be tripping when I tell them. That. They're like, <laughs> no, nah, if you've been in, in Tennessee for more than 30 years, you're from Tennessee now. <laughs> yeah. well, I ain't from Tennessee, man. I'm from Texas. But... You know, we I've been around barbecue all my life. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, my dad had barbecued every weekend. Every weekend. What I felt, I felt rain, sleet, sleet, snow, shine. And my job for many years, before the cartoons even came on, I had to go outside and clean the carport out and set the grill up for daddy to start barbecuing. Yes, yeah, sir. So I've been around barbecue all my life. And I've got good at it over the years. And probably 10 or 15 years ago, you know, I'm, I'm a boastful, bragging type guy, too. <laughs> so I make that barbecue, man, and them ribs fall off the bone. And, and uh, I would tell people, man, uh, you know, I, my partner, daddy, uh, was in a nursing home. He didn't have no teeth. Yeah, so I cooked him a rack of ribs and took to him, and it was good enough for him to eat. Yeah, he didn't have teeth in his mouth. And uh, I, I would tell people, I said, man, this barbecue good enough for me to all oh, be able to sell this barbecue was so good. <laughs> yeah, sir. And so I've been I've been saying it for so long, I just felt like, man, that's, that's what I should be doing is barbecue and selling it. Yeah, sir. So when I get ready to retire, you know, they always say, when you, before you retire, it's best to have a plan. And my my big goal was to have a, a what they call a neighborhood pub. Yeah, sir. And basically, that's just a, a spot in the neighborhood where people the neighbors and people can go and eat, drink, and have a good time, and then they wouldn't have for the drive to get back to the house. Yes, yeah, sir. So that's why they call it a neighborhood pub, because it was in the neighborhood. And so ultimately, I had been telling guys, I'm going to have my own plot, my own spot, and uh, it's going to be Big John's Barbecue and Blues, and that's what we're going to do. We're going to play the blues, we're going to sell barbecue and in this pub, you know, having some TV, watch football, and that's the best life we're going to live. Yes, yeah, sir. Well... The last five or six years or so, you know, finding buildings and, and more brick and mortars is hard to come by because everybody's leasing them. Yes, yeah, sir. So the last couple of years, I've been thinking, I'm going to give me a food trailer when I retire. And I'm going to give me a trailer. I can pull it around. I can go to different spots, different venues, and I can sell barbecue, and that's what it's going to be. And so for about the, about the last three to five years before I retired, I started working towards that. Yeah, sir. I had me a, a great big old grill, smoker made. Uh, that's on, on wheels. I can pull it behind a truck. Uh, it's a rotisserie, uh, and it cook a lot of meat. Yeah, so I had sir. that built. I had me a fish fryer built. Uh, I mean, I was doing stuff to kind of prep myself when I got ready to retire. And the last thing I needed to do was to build me a food trailer. I found a, a spot in Nashville that they customized, they build like you want it. So I designed this food trailer. Uh, I designed a wrap for it. And right as I was walking out the door to retire, I had that food trailer made. Yeah, sir. Um, and uh, and it's doing good, man. I'm That's selling good. barbecue. Yeah, sir. Uh, that food trailer's doing good. It's Big John's Barbecue and Blues right here in Clarksville, Tennessee. Yes, yeah, sir. And uh, we are, we're at the... Uh, on Wilma Rudolph in Clarksville. It's a busy road uh, at the American Signature Furniture store right behind Chuck E. Cheese. Uh, we'll be, be there Saturday, as a matter of fact, yeah, from sir. 11 to 3, and send a bunch of good barbecue, man. I've done a couple of events, and so far it's doing good, man. It's yeah, doing sir. good. That's good. And uh, I tell folks, man, it might not be the best barbecue you ever had, but it's going to be the best you're going to taste. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm cold at it, I like it. I'm cold at it, baby. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah. No, I already know. Definitely one of the best barbecues that you will ever taste. Y'all definitely got to um, tap in with them. But um, so what about, so when, I know you said that you wanted to um, have a neighborhood pub, but whenever you wasn't able to do that, like what was your mindset like having to transition into a um the food truck instead of what you originally wanted to do? Oh man, it wasn't nothing to it. Because all of it has to do with, with selling barbecue. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm doing my passion. I'm doing what I like to do. You know, I'm doing what I love to do. You know, 
and you know, people have always said, you know, if you find something that you love to do, it ain't really work. Yes, yeah, sir. And man, I love finding that grill up. And so it wasn't a, it wasn't a, it wasn't a hard transition at all because I didn't have a brick and mortar, and the the food trailer was it wasn't easy to come by, but it was a whole lot more manageable. Yes, yeah, sir. Than having to to get the the brick and mortar. So we just made it happen, man. It was just like, all right, let's do it. Let's yes, go. Sir. And uh, we made that thing happen, man. Uh, and to God be all the glory because he blessed me to be in a position where I can I can have my own food trailer. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, uh, I wrote a check for it. You know, let's go. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, this is what I've been saving up for. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, me and my wife, we got together. She she bagged me and I had her blessing. She was like, yeah, go do what you want to do. And that's what we do, man. So the reason why I ask that because a lot of people when – their dream isn't when it's like a kind of like a side track. It's not exactly the way that they envision it to be. A lot of people feel like maybe that's not meant for them anymore, and that they like the tear from their goals and stuff. Mm -hmm, so I just want mm -hmm. to see your idea on that. Yeah. So here's the deal, man. Whatever your dream is, as long as you stay on the path to get to your dream, yes, sir. Then you still one hundred. So. I might not have a pub right now. That was my dream. But I got the next best thing. And I'm still on the road toward my dream. Yes, if, if something happened or transpired, that I'm able to find a pub later on down the line. So I've already basically laid the groundwork. So I'm already getting my name out there. Yes, Everybody sir. know how good this barbecue is. And then when it's good and people start following you, they'll follow you anywhere you go. Yes, sir. If I decide to... To gut my house out and make it a pub. Guess what? They're going to come. Yes, yeah, sir. Because people have been following you. So, and that's on the road to where I'm trying to go. So, as long as you got a dream, number one. And as long as you're working your way towards the dream, number two. Then stay on the road towards your dream and everything else will work out. Uh, it's just the way it is, man. Things yeah, work sir. out. Uh, everybody always reach their dream right off the bat. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but if you're still on the road to doing what you like to do, man, you can't beat it. Yeah, you can't right. beat your hands down. I don't care what nobody say. You know, have a plan and then work the plan. Yes, yeah, sir. And that's what I'm doing right now. I had a plan. I'm working the plan. And I'm going to tell you the best thing about it. I'm enjoying the plan. Yes, yeah, sir. I'm, I'm I'm living the dream, baby. Yes, yeah, sir. It's the yeah. process of it, not always the destination. That's right, man. Yes, yeah, sir. You just got to, you got to enjoy what you do, man. I'm loving it. Yes, yeah, sir. You know what I'm saying? I, I feel like a champ every day I wake up. Yes, yeah, sir. That's good. Yeah. I love to hear that. But I want to tell you that I, I take a lot of inspiration. I'm very inspired by you that you're um following your dreams and like just the lifestyle that the conversations that we have, like it's very inspiring to me to just keep going and to keep working hard and all type of stuff like that. Man, let me tell you something, Jamani. You are one of the young men that I really, uh, I really care for. Yes, sir. Because it's, you know, just the people that's, that's going to watch this podcast, just, if they just listen to your mannerism, you know, you ain't my son. You know, I didn't raise you, but the mama that you had is still that mannerism in you and respect in you. Uh, as far as I know, you're a man of your word. When you yes, say you're going to do something, you do it. And you're just good people, man. Yes, I appreciate You know, it's, a, it's so many things you could be doing right now. Yes, sir. You can be selling dope. You can be out gang banging. You can be out pistol whooping folks, robbing people. Yes, sir. And instead, you sitting in the room on a podcast interviewing old fish. Yeah. You know sir. what I'm saying? And so many other things you could have been doing. You know what I'm saying? Uh raping little girls. You could have had, you know, five, ten kids on the way. Yeah. I sir. mean it's, it's so many things that you could have been doing. But as a young African American man, man, you on track. Yes, yeah, sir. I you on track. That. That all you gotta do, man, way. just just hold on. Yes, yeah, sir. You know what I'm saying? Keep your hand in God's unchanging hand. Yes. Yeah, and everything else will work itself out. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? Stay focused. Stay focused. And whatever your dream is, I don't know what your dream is. You know, we talked about some things. Me and you have had conversations. Uh, for my other little nephew, Scooter, we've all had conversations. But all you have to do is stay focused. Yes, sir. And remember what I, we talked about the dream 
and by being on the road, and although I ain't got my dream, but I'm still on the road, yes, that's the only thing you have to do. Whatever your dream is, keep it on the road. And as long as you stay on the road, it's okay to veer off the road every now and then. Because listen, we all can't go straight to where we're trying to go. Yeah, Sometimes right. we got to take a right here. Sometimes we got to take a left over there. And that's okay to veer off a little bit. Yes, yeah, sir. Just don't veer off too far. And stay focused. Yes, yeah, sir. As long as you stay focused, stay on the road, your dream will come to you. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, I and, I, and I appreciate you, man. Yes, yeah, sir. Yes, sir. That's um, real talk. I appreciate that. But um, so what was it like growing up in Texas for you? Like as far as like mentally um, and emotionally, like just your whole childhood, how, how, how was that for you? So, and I had a great childhood. Yes. Yeah, uh, I come from from a large family. Um, we grew up uh, in the projects in the hood. Uh, we moved to Fort Worth uh, in Eastwood, what we call Eastwood. And um, man, I had a great childhood. I grew up in a childhood where we played football in the streets. Uh, man, we shut the road down on a busy street yeah, the neighborhood. And it'd be, you know, six on six or seven on seven, however many we can get. And we play what we call sideline kill. It's like tackling in the streets. And if you got on the sideline, uh, man, you might catch an elbow or anything. It was yeah, tackle, right. man. It was rough. But, you know, I grew up in a time where we drank water from the fire, from the water holes yes, outside. And, you know, we stayed out until it got dark or until the street light came on. And we had to go in the house and... Uh, we fought every day, somebody fighting somebody. Yeah, sir. Uh, but we fought one day, and it didn't take an hour. If an hour passed, we wasn't back partners again. Something was really wrong. Yeah, sir. You know, so I had a great childhood, man. Uh, me and my little sister grew up on Griggs. Uh, in fact, my little sister's in the same house that we grew up in. I don't know how she did it, but she <laughs> came full circle and went right back to the same house. Yes, yeah, sir. And, uh, man, we had a great childhood, man. Emotionally, it was good. Uh, I went to school, uh, and a lot of people, I'm only 52 years old. Am I 52 or 53? That guy just turned 53. <laughs> yeah. But uh, uh, when I talk about segregation, uh, people are like, man, you, you ain't old enough to be talking about segregation. Well, yeah, I am. Uh, when I was in the, the third grade, yeah, third grade, no, fourth grade, they shipped us to an all-white school to desegregate this all-white school. It's called yeah, J.T. Stevens, J.T. Stevens Middle School in Fort Worth, Texas. And, man, I hated going to that school. I hated it with a passion. And what I hated about it, it's going to sound kind of simple, but we had to catch the bus before the cartoons came on. And when we got home from school, all the cartoons were already gone off. Yes, sir. So I hated going to J.C. <laughs> Stevens. But desegregating it, it was, I mean, man, it was something else, man. I was the first boy at J.T. Stevens to get a paddling. Yes, yeah, sir. My daddy told me, he was very adamant about it, and my daddy wasn't racist or none of that. He was just a strong, strong black man. Yes, yeah, sir. My daddy told me, he said, son, don't go to the white folks' school and embarrass us. He said, I don't want no phone calls. And you go out there like you got, like you got good sense. And I went out to school probably a week. And I was in the bathroom, and these boys was bullying this heavyset white kid. And they had his glasses in the toilet, and they was trying to flush the, the glasses down the toilet. Yes, sir. The little boy was crying and going on. And I was like, man, leave the boy alone. So I kind of moved him out the way, and I rushed in that toilet and grabbed the boy glasses. And one of the boys called me a nigger. And it was four of them. I'll never forget it. Man, I punched him in his eye. And he fell back. The other boys came. And I was running him out. Yeah, sir. Well, you got to remember, when that's all we did was fight. Yeah, these sir. Would. <laughs> and, man, I was killing them. Yeah, I was sir. talking about, man, all four of them. Man, one of them nose. I hit one of them in his nose. And his nose bust like a tomato. It was like blood everywhere. And, man... Teacher came in, they took me to the principal's office, and I got in trouble for helping this, this kid out that they was bullying. Yeah, sir. And so I was mad about that for a long time. And the teacher told me, he said, listen, he said, uh, I'm about to call your daddy, or, or you can take three licks. 
I was like, ooh, don't call daddy. Yes, yeah, I'll take three licks. I'm thinking, you no, know, we got whoopers all the time. You know, the whoopers that we got was really child abuse. Yeah, sir. You know, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> Man, we got towed up. Yeah, sir. But uh, I'm going to take the three licks. And uh, they told me to put my hands on the desk. i never forget, just like it was yesterday. Put my hands on the desk. He grabbed the back of my pants. And he hit me, man. And it felt like fire going through my body. Yeah, and I don't know what was going on. I know it wasn't no belt. Man, I jumped on top of that desk and I turned around and he had a paddle in his hand. And I never seen a paddle before. I know what a paddle was. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, mama beat us with stitch cords and shoes and whatever she can get her hands on. Yes, yeah, sir. But I, I ain't never seen a paddle. It made it like a piece of wood. Man, I jumped on top of that desk and uh, I never forget he had a, a lamp on his desk, one of them emerald green lamps. And I grabbed that lamp and I stood back with my back up against the wall. I said, boy, if you don't call my dad right now, so I'm going to turn this office up. <laughs> and uh, I was kicking stuff off. Man, I was just creating a big scene. Yeah, they sir. was thinking, man, this little black boy up here, and this <laughs> girl, he's acting a fool. Yeah. So long story short, they called uh, my mama. And my mama said she was on the way. Well, it was way on the other side of time. It's like it took a, it's every bit of an hour to get there. Yeah, sir. Pinned on traffic, you know. Anyway, mama came, her and my aunt. And I said, uh, what's going on? So he's on the desk and he came in. I was still on, I was still on the desk. Yeah, sir. And uh, I was crying. I said, Mama, hit me with a hit me with a piece of wood. She said, What? I said, Yeah, he got a stick. He beat me with a stick. And she looked, she said, What's going on? And the prep said, well, I had this powder, and he would he beat up these four boys. So it was either call his dad or, or he's gonna take three licks with the powder. Mom looked at the piece of wood, and it must have shocked her, too. She said, the best thing for you to do is leave, because his dad is on the way, and he's not going to be happy. Yes, sir. And see, daddy always wore coveralls to work, but he had a thirty-two pistol that he used to carry in his bed with coveralls all the time. Yes, sir. And when daddy got there, he had his hand in his, in his bill on that pistol. I already knew. Yes, sir. And uh, I said, yeah. I said, my dad's going to shoot all y'all. <laughs> y'all might want well to get ready. Yes, sir. And uh, long story short, when daddy got there, I stayed up there that day. Even when mom was there, I was, she just stayed right there. So daddy got there, I got down, and dad asked the principal what happened. He said, well, your son beat up four boys. He said, but he never told him. Why? Why? Yeah, sir. Dad said, uh, son, is that right? And I went to tell him about what happened. He said, take the other two licks. Now he asked the principal, said, do everybody get the same thing? He said, if somebody had beat up the boys like your son did, they probably get the spell. That's it. Come on, take the other two licks. I was like, what? Yeah, sir. It was like, go over there, take them other two licks. And I'm looking at him like you're looking at me, like, you can't be serious. Yeah, sir. Like, you finna let this white man, like, beat me with this stick? Yeah, sir. He was like, I ain't gonna tell you again. Look, yeah. Well, I'm crying and boo hooing, and I'm getting on to the desk. And then he he reached over that paddle and he kind of barely touched me. Yeah, the mother two licks and told me to go ahead on. <laughs> Man, but I, I died on both of them. Yeah, he me, ah! I was falling out on the floor. <laughs> so, you know, growing up, man, going through that segregation period, that was something different. Yes. You know what I'm saying? Uh, it was something different. Because uh, we were on the football team. Because we, we, we ran all over folks in the football uh, they just couldn't stop us, man. Yeah, sir. You know, these little black kids out the, out the hood. And <laughs> so I went through the desegregation part, you know, uh, and, you know, we was talking about uh, the difference in uh, the punishment and the the whoopings and the stuff, you know, when we got in trouble as kids. Yeah, sir. And uh, I was at J.T. Stevens. Uh, this was probably, this was later on during the year at the same school. Yeah, sir. And uh, we was talking about getting a whooping. And so, the white boy told me, he said, we don't get whoopings. He said, oh, we call 911. I was like, what? Call 911? And that's when 911 had just came out. They yeah, just started. You know, you, should, you, have to, you won't remember this, but we used to have a dial a zero to get the operator. And then the operator transferred you to the police department. Yes, yeah, sir. Well, back then, 911 had just came out. And we had them old rotary phones, so you had to dial the yeah. line on the one one. And so the white boy told me, he said, you dial 911, 
and tell the police you've been child abuse, they're going to get your mama and tell, put, put her in jail. I was like, what? I said, that can't be right. Yeah, sorry. He said, yeah, yeah, we don't get whoopings. We call 911. Man, I couldn't wait to get another whoop. <laughs> Man, my sister, we had, I had a, for Christmas, we always got everything hand me down. So, like, when Atari came out, we had the old, what they call ping pong. You wouldn't know that either. But it was just a game, had two lines on it, the ball, go up and down, boom, boom, and you slide the pal up, hit the ball. I mean, it was an old raggedy ass game. Yeah, but, sir. But all my friends were getting BB guns. And so they had the, those cock, you know, 320 PSI yes, kind of guns sir. that you cock up. And they was real popular when we was growing up. And so I told I've been telling mama them all year, like, I want a BB gun. So quite naturally, instead of them going to give me that the cock up kind, the real powerful that you can reach out and tell somebody, they go give me that old Daisy one cock BB gun. Yes, sir. Where you put about 200 BBs off in there and you cock it one time and shoot it. And the kids used to talk about me because we would set up water cans and they shoot and put holes in there and the water come out. And I shoot a can and couldn't even put a dent in it. <laughs> well, long story short, my, my sisters were laughing yeah. because they were talking about me. And she had on some roller skates with the old iron, the old white roller skates with the iron wheels on them. You probably don't know about them either. But I took my BB gun, I shot it in the foot. You know, put it right on her toe and shot it. Yeah, sir. Man, that didn't hurt her. That had been more hurt than a man on the moon. <laughs> but she went there and told mama. Boy, mama wore me out. Yeah. Golly. She, had, she was ironing. And uh, when I came in, Joyce was telling me what was going on. She said, go get me a bell. And I thought, dog. When I said dog and did my hair like that, she snatched that iron. That cord came out. And she wham. And she slung that cord. And it wrapped around my head. It went, boom, hit me on this side, and that cord wrapped around. Yeah, and that man. cord caught me on my ear. Boy, I thought I had died. Boy, I, boy that, that was the worst pain you could ever tell. Yeah, sir. And boy, and then she took her shoe off and stole one because she didn't, couldn't find the belt. Well, she wore my ass out. Man, I'm talking about for a while. She said, I'm going to go out here and smoke the cigarette. When I come back, I'm going to whoop your ass again. I thought, Lord. She went outside. I went and got that phone. And then... The phone have a cord, one of the long cords on it. You know, you can take the phone and go all through the house with the cord. Yes, yeah, sir. So I took the phone and went in the room and got in the closet. I'm going to dial 911. 911, what's your emergency? I'm being child abused. What? Yeah, my mama child abused me. I need you to come get her. Yes, yeah, sir. what she do? I said, well, she, she hit me with a stitch cord on the iron. What? It was a white lady on the phone. Man, man she was scared. I was scaring her to death. Yeah, sir. And then she took her shoe and she beat me until she found the bell. What? Where you at? Stay on the phone. I said, no, I can't stay on the phone. <laughs> said, because she, when she finished smoking, she's going to get me again. I got to hurry up. Yeah, sir. So I hung the phone up. <laughs> I waited a little while. And all of a sudden, I heard the door open up. I thought, man, here come mama. Oh, she done found me. It was my sister, Joyce. Joyce said, what? It's about five cars and police out here. I said, what? Yeah. I said, yeah. I said, they finna take mama to jail. We ain't gonna never get no more whoopings. I said, we, could, we ain't never get no more whoopings. They finna take mama to jail. Yeah, sir. Man, I came outside. Looked at all them police standing around there. And then in the hood, they come, you know, too deep. And there was five cars of them. Yeah, sir. Ten police come to get mama. So all of them was white except for one. So what I do, I go straight to the black police officer. And a white officer came and got me. He said, come on over here and talk to me. So they were talking to mama. And uh, they were talking to mama. And, you know, by now, everybody in the neighborhood, this is in the summertime. <laughs> yes, sir. Everybody in the neighborhood outside. It's yes, 5 o'clock in the evening. <laughs> Man, you thought somebody got killed. Yes, sir. So I went over with this, with this white officer. He said, where you heard that? I said, my ear. And then, my ear was still ringing. He said, I don't see no marks. I said, uh, I said, Mark? He said, yeah, it didn't, it didn't leave a mark. So I said, well, hold on a minute. I took my shirt off. I said, what about over here on my back? I said, I'll be something right there. No, I don't see nothing. I said, well, what about on this side over here? 
mean, she she hit me with the shoe on this side. Yeah, sir. No, I don't, I don't, I don't see nothing. So I went to take, put my shorts on. I said, no, no, don't take your shorts. I said, no, look at my butt. I said, did she beat me with the, with the strap on my butt? I said, yeah, got to be something. He said, ain't nothing. I said, shoot. He said, all right, come on. We went back over there. And Joyce, my sister came out the house with the belt. I said, yeah, they must have taken that for evidence. Man, Joyce gave that belt to my mama, and she had that cigarette in her mouth. And that black officer said, Ooh, what you finna do? She said, I'm finna whoop his ass. He said, ma'am? He said, yeah, I'm finna whoop his ass. And when I'm done, y'all can take him with you or take me or whatever you're gonna do. Yes, yeah, I said, but I'd rather whoop his ass now than 10 years, y'all take him down that jail and whoop him down there. And man, that probably was the worst whooping I ever got in my life yeah, from all the police. And man, you know, I hated police. Man, I was, I, mean, I think they talk about PTSD, man. Post traumatic stress, I had it with the police. Yes, yeah, sir. Because I called the police to help me, and, yeah. and they didn't help me. Yes, yeah, sir. They was there watching. Yes, yeah, sir. Man, I hated police for a long time. Man, I was man, I chunk rocks at their cars and they drive by. Yes, yeah, sir. I'd be trying to knock the windows out. We had a, a alley uh, on Griggs, and we had with no more chili bricks. Yes, yeah, sir. Man, I sit there all day waiting on the police to come by. I'm taking three or four hours. <laughs> police come by, and I pick up and I win. <laughs> <laughs> and I slang and knock their window out the car. Take out running. Yes, yeah, sir. Man, I hated the police, man. Man, I hated the police for a long time, you Yes, yeah, sir. Man, I'm telling you. But let me tell you, overall, growing up, man, I had a good childhood, man. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, the whoopings and the stuff we got, man, we need them. You know, now people call it child abuse for real. Yes, yeah, sir. Because you can't do to the kids now the things that we got done to us by our parents. Yes, yeah, sir. But look, I'm still living. And look at look at the type of person I turned out to be. Yes, yeah, sir. Man, them, them ass whoopers. Some of y'all, some of y'all ran from y'all ass whoopers. I know, y'all know. Uh, nah, <laughs> especially, I, I especially know. your brother Scooter. <laughs> I know he ran for some ass whoopers. He need he need his ass whooped today probably. <laughs> but no, man, we had good lives growing up, man. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, we didn't really get nothing. You know, our Christmases. You know, we always ate good. You know, we always ate that old government cheese and and pinto beans and. But man, that was a good life back then. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, Christmas, we didn't really have nothing for Christmas. Everything was hand me down. I remember Christmas, man. Two Christmases stand out of my mind. One Christmas to stand out is my mama got on the list to go to the Goodwill to get some, some gifts for Christmas. Yes, yeah, sir. And we went to go get our gifts. And it was some, some of them old blue, what we call booty shorts. A pair of white socks, a pair of brown hush puppies, and a Dallas Cowboy t-shirt. And uh, and you can get a, a Nerf ball, either football, soccer, basketball, but it was a Nerf. Yes, I, I remember getting a football. And I thought, man, it's the best Christmas I ever had until I got to school. Man, every black kid in there had on them blue shorts and white socks. The brown hush puppies and a Dallas Cowboy t shirt. Man, there's about six of us walking around like twins. I thought, man, what kind of Christmas is this? Yes, sir. I mean, Santa Claus went to all y'all house, brought y'all the same thing we got. <laughs> and then my, my second Christmas that I remember is we didn't have nothing. It was Christmas Eve, and Mom had already told us, look, we're not going to be able to get no Christmas this year. Said, but we'll try it again next year. So we accepted that. It wasn't no big deal to us. Yes, sir. You know, we probably about, I probably about eight, nine years old. But I remember going to bed, and Mama, we had a piano that sat up against the wall, and Mama didn't even put up a regular Christmas tree. We had an old fall, what we call fall Christmas tree, that all the things you just stick in, and it was an old raggedy project type Christmas tree, but everybody had them. But we didn't even put the tree up this year. Yes, sir. Because she had already told us we weren't going to have anything. So she had went to, uh, back then, a store called Mott's. And she had bought one of the little bitty Christmas trees. and had lights already on it. And she had it sitting on top of the piano. I'll never forget it. We went to bed. And it was not one present up under that tree. And I heard something. We went to bed. And I was asleep. And I thought I was dreaming. But I heard Mama hollering and crying. And boo-hooing and going on. I jumped up to see what was going on. And... The ladies that Mama worked with had went Christmas shopping for us. 
and they had the, the car backed up all the way in the yard to the front door. Yes. Yeah, and they was, man, they were bringing all these presents in. Man, it's like it was a hundred presents. Man, it was all over the piano, all in the flow. Man, it was so many presents. I'll never forget it. Yes, yeah, sir. Man, that was one of the best Christmas we ever had. Went from not having nothing to my mama friends. Went and bought all this stuff for us for Christmas. And man, let me tell you something. I normally don't tell nobody this. But when when I went to internal affairs, uh, I had just went through a divorce. Uh, my child was, was still young. And I was working in town first, and I got a pretty significant raise. And the internal affairs was had drew names, three names in each region, and it was three people that was needy that we were gonna provide Christmas gifts for their kids. And I thought, man, that's a good idea. So we had four names, and they picked three, and one wasn't gonna get nothing. So I said, I'm gonna take that family, and I'm gonna take care of them on my own. And my daughter, she was probably eight, nine years old, probably the same age I was when we had this Christmas. And I took her to Walmart and we filled up two shopping carts full of gifts yes, sir. for these two kids. And we went home and wrapped them. And man, I can't wrap nothing. I, I mean, you do better taking a piece of fall and wrap it around something. <laughs> but we wrapped up two carts full of stuff for these kids. And I've been doing it ever since. Yeah, My sir. family, we always find a family to adopt uh, at Christmas time and during the holidays. And even today, it's tradition. Um, and I don't do it to brag. I do it just because we're able to, and this is our tradition. Yes, yeah, sir. Every year, we find a, a family that's in need, and we provide Christmas for that family. We did it last year. Um, last year, it was a, a lady... And I didn't even know this part of Clarksville even existed. But she was in the hood of Clarksville. Yeah, sir. Her and her child. And I forgot her child was about 10, maybe. And, man, we... I can't tell you how many hundreds of dollars we spent on that girl. Yeah, sir. And that girl would never, probably never, ever have a better Christmas. And it's been, been like that for the last, shit, man, 10, 12 years, maybe. Yeah, probably sir. At 12, 12, 15 years. I adopt, adopt, excuse me, adopt the family every year. And every time I do it, it's because I think back when somebody did it for me. Yeah, sir. And so now, like, I always pay it forward, man. Always. I don't care what it is. Sometimes I be uh, in a restaurant eating, and I might tell the waitress, you know, and just whoever God put on my heart, hey, bring me that ticket. Don't even tell them who, did, don't even tell them who paid for it. Yeah, just sir. pay for it. Uh, I do it all the time, man. Yeah, sir. Uh, when I'm in the barbershop, uh, it's kids, when I say kids, you know, uh, young men. I see young men come in the barber shop, and uh, the barber might say something about them going to school or something like that. I say, hey, man, you in college? Yes, sir, my first year. I'm just home visiting. I said, uh, well, how are your grades looking? Oh, man, they, they looking pretty good. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Tell the barber, I got his cut. You know, I do it all the time. Yeah, sir. And just pay it forward. And a lot of times, they're like, man, you have to do this, sir. I said, listen, the only thing I want you to do is may not be next year, it might be five years, maybe be 20 years down the line. Just think about somebody paying it for it for you and you do it for somebody else. Yeah, sir. And that's how we that's how we build these these memories, man. Thinking back all the years ago when old old John was eight, nine years old, somebody came and made the Christmas. Special for me. Yeah, sir. And and how many lives can I touch now? You know, I used to make good money as a Christian administrator. Yeah, sir. You know, I was, I was probably the first. In fact, I know I was. I was the first African American in that capacity making a six figure salary, and it didn't take long. I was make. I started out making more than other Christian administrators. Yeah, sir. And so I was doing good. You know. But I always try to make sure that I bless somebody else. Yes, yeah, sir. Always, man. And that's something that you got to remember, too. That's part of, uh, if God bless you, be a blessing for somebody else. Yes, yeah, sir. You know what I'm saying? I try to be humble when I do it. I don't, in fact, I can't even believe I'm telling you that I do it. Because to me, being humble is not what you do for others, 
for you to go tell everybody what it is that you're doing. Yes, yeah, sir. So that's not really the blessing, you know. But the reason I tell somebody is because I want them to see me blessing somebody so that they Inspired. will bless yes, somebody. And you know, they inspire. So they say, man, I remember old Fish did this, so I'm going to do that. And now it's a guy to my daughter. Now she's doing her own, blessing other folks. Yes, yeah, sir. And it's because she always say, well, I saw daddy doing this, so it must be right. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, and so that's what make you, that's what make you them proud daddy moments, man. When you know that, you know, the things that you think that you are doing right, they really are right. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, when you look and, and see the fruits of your labor, you know, because you plant these seeds and now you see the tree and grew up tall and it's bearing fruit and it's feeding all the other folks. And that's what makes it feel good. Man. Yeah, sir. That's what gives you that feeling like, yeah, I done done something. Yeah, sir. You know, if I die today, I think if I, if they don't remember nothing else about fish, don't remember how hard it was, don't remember, you know, how he used to fight inmates and, you know, they used to call me... One time, because I, I hit them one time, they fall out. <laughs> yeah, don't, I don't remember none of that. Remember me taking care of the families. Remember me blessing folks. Remember the good work I did in the in the Prince Hall Associated Masonic District. Remember all the people that I helped. You know, those things I won't be remembered for. Yes, sir. You know, and remember one other thing that's really, really important. They have some good ass barbecue. Yes, that's sir. what's important. <laughs> yeah, that's definitely important. Yeah, that's, that's, that's all. That's what I want to remember. <laughs> yes, sir. So I want to know, like, I have two more questions for you. So, okay, what did football teach you growing up? And then after you give your answer, I'm gonna ask you this other question. So football, and this it started in football, and I think that's why it carried over to the military because a lot of people say. The military teach you discipline. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, uh, you hear parents say, "I want to send my son to the military so he can get some, earn some, learn some discipline." Yes, yeah, sir. Well, the military does teach you discipline, but it started in football. That's where I learned the discipline from, um, because you had to be disciplined to to play football. And I started out doing good in football, man. I really did, and uh, I was on my way. Uh, my my father passed away. Uh, but I was going to go to Texas A&M and I was going to play football. And when my father passed, uh, I, that's what caused me going to go into the military because I needed to make some money because my mama wasn't working. My sister was still in school. So, but football, that's where the discipline started at. Yes, yeah, sir. And that's what I learned in football, you know, is that discipline, man. Uh, that's where it started at. Yes, yeah, sir. in football. And then, so the last question that I have for you is, what advice could you give on, like, not just a long marriage, but, like, your relationships you have with, like, all your friends and, like, the people you consider as brothers and sisters and, and also with, the, like, marriage, too? So, you know, it's always that old saying, happy wife, happy life. Yes, sir. But there's a couple of things that got to, that got to come together with that marriage. One, there's got to be some communication. Yes, yeah, you got to communicate. If you don't communicate, man, it just you just fail already. You got to have some trust. Uh, and then the other part of that is respect. And I think if you uh, encompass those three things in your your marriage, uh, oh man, I can't leave out the most important thing is that God. You got to keep God in there. Yes, yeah, sir. But those those four things you have to encompass encompass those into your relationship and those uh, get you a long way. Um, communication, respect, trust, and always keep God first. Uh, and as far as your friendship and in the world, man, you know, you have to surround yourself with good people. Yeah, sir. And you, you hear that old saying, iron sharp as iron. And that's a fact. If if you hang around good people, then you suffer to be better yourself. Yes, sir. If if you hang around a bunch of low life that ain't doing nothing, then you suffer to be a low life yourself. Yes, sir. And never do nothing. So when you choosing your friends, you know, try to choose somebody who's doing better than you. 
to hang with. You know what I'm saying? Or somebody that's on at least the same level that you're on. Yes, yeah, sir. Because if, if you hang with somebody that's on a lower level than you are, they suffer to bring you down. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, I don't care if y'all grew up together. I don't care how long y'all been partners. If they down here and you up here, then I don't care. It might not be today. It might be next year. But eventually, they start to bring you to their level. So hang with somebody that's on your level or somebody higher. So you constantly trying to be better. Yes, yeah, sir. You know what I'm saying? Um, and, and keep that in mind when you're choosing your friends. Yes, yeah, sir. You know what I'm saying? Make sure they're doing something. Make sure they make sure they about the business. It's okay to have fun and kick it and 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 chase women and or whatever it is that kids do nowadays. Yes, yeah, sir. But as long as you're still trying to be about the business, that's what you have to keep in mind. And you have to do it at an early age. You can't wait. Like two or three years from now, like what you nineteen? Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, you got to start right now. Yes, yeah, sir. You know the friends that you choose, they either be on the same level you on or a little bit higher because iron sharpens iron. You know, iron ain't gonna sharpen a dirt rock. Yes, yeah, sir. You feel me? Yes, yeah, sir. Now see, you can be iron and you up here, and your partner's a dirt rock. But what happens when you run that iron up against a dirt rock? Break it. It just breaks. But if your friend is up here with you, and both of y'all are iron, iron sharp as iron, you just get sharper and sharper and sharper, and then before you know it, man, you know, y'all dragging each other to the top. Yeah, sir. You know, so uh, just keep those things in mind, man. Uh, iron sharp as iron. Yeah, sir. You know, the friends you choose, they have to be on the same level. They can't be on that dumb shit because there's too much going on in the world today. Yeah, sir. You know what I'm saying? You want somebody who's going to bring you up. Not somebody's gonna drag you down, and, and and be mindful. It's a lot of jealousy in the world. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? People be jealous of you, man. Man, Jemaine, nineteen year old, he got a podcast going on. Uh, what can I do to hurt him? You know, and I'm telling you, it happens. People are jealous. They will be jealous of you. You know, look at his hair. Look how he carries himself. He at the gym working out. Yes, sir. You know what I'm saying? He doing this and doing that. He ain't got no kids. Look, these girls, they get pregnant. Just to give you a baby. Yes, yeah, sir. Just to bring you down. Not all not all girls are bad girls. I mean, but you get the gist of what I'm saying. Yes, yeah, sir. So you have to be careful, man. When you're having sex, protect yourself. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, don't take the girl's word that, that she on the pill. Uh, uh, you know, I ain't had my period yet. I'm good. Da, da, da. Yeah, sir. You know, protect yourself. Um, when you hang with your friends, you know, let the intuition be the guide. You know, the ruling God of your faith. Yeah, sir. You know, if you don't feel right, it probably ain't right. You know, uh, driving 100 miles an hour, shit, trying to show out, uh, smoking dope. I mean, like I said, there's so many things that you could be doing that you ain't doing that I really, really respect. Yeah, sir. Now, let me tell you something, man. You're going to have some fun growing up. I'm not, I'm not stupid. I'm not dumb to the fact. But I just want you to be smart about the things that you do. Yeah, sir. And... You more than anybody, you and my other, my nephew, uh, school and, and y'all, I tell y'all this all the time, but you can call me anytime. Yeah, sir. I don't care. Just don't call and say, hey, you know, I'm doing a podcast or don't call. Listen, you can call me anytime, anytime, day or night. Yeah, sir. You need some advice. If you get in trouble or something happened or, or you got something on your mind, something you want Man, just call me, man. Yeah, sir. Because I'm really, really down to earth. I got a good head on my shoulders. I, I, I don't mind listening. And I'm not going to lead you astray. Yeah, sir. Now, you might not like some of the things I tell you when I tell you, but we're going to keep it 100. Yeah, sir. And if I can help you get through it, we're going to get through it together. Yeah, sir. Now, you do some stupid shit you want to, you go out there and shoot up 12, 15 folks and call me. I'm going to be like, listen, I'm going to help you out. Every night if I go to bed, I'm going to pray for you. And hope you do better. Yes, yeah, sir. But I can't help you out of that. Yes, yeah, sir. But other things that you can, that we can prevent, or things that's on your mind, uh, you having issues or trouble or whatever it is, man, just pick up the phone and call. Yes, yeah, sir. So I'm telling you. I appreciate that. We can work it out, man. Yes, yeah, sir. The I two of us together, we can work it out. I appreciate Just a phone call away, man. Yes, yeah, sir. Real talk. And yeah. I know I said that was my last question, but I do want to know, like, What's the thing that you enjoy the most about fatherhood? I know you said one of the things was um like the reassurance of what you, what you've done was right, like the things that you taught. But like I want to hear like um, one more thing. 
So I got three kids now and one grandbaby. Uh, I got my biological daughter and I got two sons by marriage and I just got a new granddaughter. Um, and probably the, I'll, I'll talk on my, my daughter first. Uh, when I just look at her, at the woman she's become, you and you got to know, man, I was hard on my daughter. Yeah, sir. Growing up, man, she had it bad. She got whoopings. Like I said, she got whooping whoopings. Yeah, Like sir. old school whoopings. Um, her daddy was the police. You know, investigated, you know, criminal actions. You know, I'm the one that showed up at her class in full police ride gear. Vest, police hat, pistol, ride baton, cuffs. And they were like, what's going on? None of us came to see Janique. What's how she doing in class? Real embarrassing. Yeah, sir. But that's one of them calls you get where, hey, your daughter up here running the mouth, won't be quiet in class. Okay, no matter, I got her. And then that's how you show up in school. So when I look at the things that she's been through, uh, my daughter, she went to nursing school. She was the first one in my family, immediate family, to go to, to college. She went to nursing school to be a registered nurse. She's an RN. Uh, after about 14 months, she became a, a interim supervisor, RN supervisor. And she stayed with me right out of school. And she had just started her job. And I told her, I said, listen, you can stay here. It won't cost you nothing. But you got to save uh, $1,000 a month. Uh, and you put that up, and I got to be able to look in your account and see it. And I don't care what you do with the rest of your money, but you got to save $1,000 a month. And she ended up, I think, saving $1,200 a month. And she did it for almost three years. So you can imagine the type of money she had saved after three years, saving $1,200 a month. Yeah, sir. She moved into her, bought her own house. Um, she bought her own house, it's a townhouse, but bought her house uh, at, a, at a young age. I think she was 23 or 24, maybe 23, yeah. But she became a homeowner at 23. Uh, I bought her a car, but she she uh, paid her own insurance and all that good stuff. Yeah, sorry. She bought her own furniture when she got ready to move in, brand new. Uh, she ain't got no kids. She ain't strung out on drugs. She ain't no hoe. She ain't no thought. She ain't none of that. Yeah, She's sir. just a good, a good child. And out of all the things, same thing I said, all the things you could have been doing, she could have been doing. She's just the opposite, man. She's just a good child. And she is not to this day. I ain't gonna say what's gonna happen tomorrow. <laughs> but as of this day, she ain't broke my heart not one time. Yes, yeah, sir. Not one time. She ain't never been in jail. Man, she's just a good kid. And she's the best kid that a father could ask for. Yes, yeah, sir. My sons, uh, I'm there for both of my sons. They both are still trying to find their way, but they both are good boys. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, and I've been over backwards. I'll do anything for any one of them. And, of course, my grandbaby, you know, I try to play tough, but really she got me wrapped around the finger. <laughs> but uh, uh, if somebody asked me, I try to play tough. And play, <laughs> I got on. Oh, well, get away from me, you know. <laughs> Turn your ass or something. Yes, yeah, sir. But, uh yeah, man, I've just been blessed, man. Uh, I try to be a good father, try to be a good role model, a good example. Um, you know, my daughter was growing up, I was divorced. I was living a single life. Yeah, sir. Uh, my daughter stayed most weekends with me when possible, when I wasn't working. Uh, in the summertime, I try to keep her as much as I could. Uh, I try to be very respectful. Uh, my daughter never saw another woman spend night at my house. Yeah, sir. Um, and I didn't bring women around her. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> so, uh, I tried to be a good role model growing up, man. And and so I like to think that I was successful doing that, man. When I look at her, I know I was successful. Yes, yeah, sir. You know what I'm saying? Um, and it ain't just me, man. Folks tell me all the time when they look at my daughter, it's like, man, that girl got it going on. Yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, but she had a tough life. Now, she had to pay for it. Yes, yeah, sir. You know, like I said, she, she had a strict father, you know. But it was just because I wanted the best for her. You yeah, know what I'm saying? And uh, she, she did, she's doing good. 
And my sons are doing good as well. They they still got a little ways to go. They working on finding themselves. Uh, they got their own unique ways about them. Yes. Yeah, uh, my one son Xavier. He grew up playing football. He was a beast of football. Uh, and my other son Duran. You know, he was an animal lover, animal advocate. Uh, man, you know he he won't he won't kill a fly. Yes, and, sir. And he, if you see you kill a fly, my ass, I'm gonna say to you. Yes, sir. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, man, uh, father or something else, man. Yes, sir. Yeah, just just blessed, man. But I want to tell you that I appreciate you for coming on and sharing your knowledge and wisdom, and I also want to tell you, like, just reassuring that I definitely like believe that you are a great man and i appreciate the relationship that we have and i want you to know i truly do cherish that and i wouldn't trade it for anything in the world yes sir Jemima, that means a lot bro yes sir yes sir i appreciate you having me on all right bro all right